This is taking part of taking uh, part of the Eden Distance Learning Week, and the topic for this afternoon's uh, webinar is the future of distance um, education universities. I think uh, it would be a, a, perhaps an understatement on my part if I said that we have politically stable times at the moment. We're far from that. There's lots of uh, change taking place. And um, I think we will inevitably see this reflected in uh, at a university level. There's political change, social change, and also technological change. And I think we're we're very lucky today to have with us five experts who are going to share their uh, views on this uh, on this topic. And hopefully, we'll have some time for uh, for debate as we as we go along. So we've got um, Antonio Teixeira from the Universidade de Aberta in Portugal, who's a Eden Senior Fellow. Hello, Antonio. Hello, Tim. Thank you. We've got uh, Tony Bates, who really needs little introduction, although he has done that himself in the chat, so I won't, uh, I won't repeat myself there. Hello, Tony. Hi. Hi, everybody. We've got Jose Mota, who's from the Universidad Aberta in Portugal. Hello, Jose. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here today with you. Nice to have you here. We have um, Alan Tate from the Open University in the UK, who's also a, an Eden Senior Fellow. Hello, Hello Alan. Wonderful. And we will shortly have Liz Ma, who's um, also, also at the OU UK, but will be participating in her capacity as the um, EADTU president uh, this afternoon. So here we are. I mean, I was. Uh, conscious that perhaps you needed a couple of minutes to to get in and get settled before we actually started but uh, I think we're all really itching to to get going that will perhaps give us more time for for uh, um, questions and interaction so what I'm going to do now is to change over to the um, the presentation view and um, then hand it over to my my colleague Antonio and uh, and let him start our first uh, our first presentation thank you Antonio well, thank you, Tim, for the nice presentation. Uh, well, uh, welcome everyone, and uh, also uh, I would like to start by thanking the kind invitation to take part in this uh, webinar, uh, especially because it's uh, not only an European uh, webinar in this sense, it's the, although promoted by Eden, but it's uh, uh, really a global um, initiative, as, as you know. Well, uh, the topic that I was um, invited to speak about uh, uh, is directly um, connected with the situation of the distance teaching universities, and in particular, in my case, of the European universities in Europe. And that uh, is uh, the topic that I would like to submit uh, for our common reflection, our shared reflection. Uh, the title that I've chosen, uh, Vive la Différence, uh, it's, it's a way of uh, already uh, stating my position <laughs> regarding this topic. So the, the subtitle, Reclaiming the Uniqueness of Open Universities in Europe, uh, gives also uh, an idea of what I will be uh, sharing with you. Um, as, as you know, uh, we are in the midst of a complex pro process, but a very um, um, powerful one, of um, digital transformation of the uh, higher education system, not only across Europe, but across the, the world, across the globe. Uh, and as it, it is um, uh, presented here in this uh, slide, which actually uh, um, I, I brought, uh, actually uh, I used from a work at the GIST in, in the UK, uh, gives a, a clear representation of how this uh, process is complex and involves all different aspects of our um, of our life. So, of course, it's not the digital uh, transformation of the universities, of the institutions as such, higher education institutions, is not a kind of a standalone process. It's part of a, a global and complex process of digital transformation of the society, of our own way of living, and, of course, uh, the way that not only we communicate, but also uh, we share our thoughts, our expectations, we share our, our products, our... our um, our productions, well, everything. And in this sense, uh, uh, the higher education system, uh, uh, to use a, uh, an expression that has been uh, coined by, by Alan Tate, who is uh, here with us today, uh, it, this landscape of higher education is uh, rapidly changing 
as uh, the, the system goes digital. And the question is, how are, uh, or uh, are, of course, in this sense, the open universities or the distance teaching universities keeping pace with this transformation, with this uh, digital transformation? Uh, as we, uh, we can see now, uh, there are a, a number of important um, things that, uh, that, that are changing, that are being transformed. One of them is the multiple variations and modalities that digital education is, um, is now knowing, both as a single or a blended approach. We're talking about distance education, but also open education, network education, technology enhanced learning, and a, a number of other um, forms in which this digital uh, transformation of education uh, is assuming. Uh, it, on the other hand, the digital transformation of higher education institutions is, has, is also having a, a big impact on the organizational model and the culture, organizational culture of the institutions as well. We're talking now of disaggregated universities, networked universities, uh, public-private partnerships, peer uh, higher education institutions, but, and, and, and some, some much other forms as well. Also an important aspect has to do with the change uh, of the operation models of the institutions. We're now uh, very much uh, promoting international joint degrees, but also patchwork degrees, uh, very much, uh, of course, for, um, based on student mobility, on the promotion of student mobility, also on this integration between formal, non-formal and informal learning, uh, also talking about nano degrees and uh, this sort of new so, uh, kinds of certification. And apart from this, we also um, seen the, the first uh, results of this movement, this process that started in the last decade of recentering on students uh, the, the educational process, the learning process, and also widening their participation in, in the process as well. So we're not very much uh, thinking about learning co-design, peer learning, peer assessment, personalization, and so many other things uh, of this sort. On the other hand, we're also seeing and possibly this is one of the biggest changes uh, as we speak of the evolution and transformation of the assessment and certification models. Uh, we are talking not only about uh, the um, mainstream and mainstreaming of e-assessment, but also of the introduction of new forms of assessment as real authentic context-based assessment, new other innovative forms of assessing and certifying, certifying competencies as, for instance, digital certificates, open badges, and so on, and so forth. On the other hand, learning flexibility is now paramount, not just for distance education, but uh, in general. Uh, and we're witnessing the focus, uh, the increasing focus on asynchronous communication in the part of, uh, of course, online learning, but also uh, the importance of learning for future skills, life skills, and all of this. Finally, there's also a transformation of the teaching and learning ecosystem as such. And uh, we, we, of course, now uh, are uh, bearing witnesses to the impact of the use of, uh, of the wide use of open educational practices, uh, PLEs, learning analytics, um, educational intelligence, diverse teaching models, uh, and so forth. In this, in this sense, in this scenario, how are open universities or distance teaching universities in general uh, coping with, with the transformation? How are they reacting and how are they also taking part in this transformation? And I have here three um, main issues uh, that I would like to address. What still, which is the basic, uh, uh, the basic problem, what still differentiates open universities from other universities delivering distance education? Is the, 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 have, the fact that they have a dedicated infrastructure, the fact that they are scalable or more scalable than the others, it's the pedagogical approach or model that they're using which is different, is the flexibility that is increased in their case, is the staff training expertise and experience, um, what, is, uh, uh, what is the core of this difference? On the other hand, how are open universities or business teaching universities managing to widen the participation and not only the access? Of learners by, personal, by increasing personalization, by in, in, in implementing peer assessment, by introducing learning co design, what other forms? Uh, finally, how are open universities or distance teaching universities bridging formal, non formal, and informal learning? Is by uh, the, the um, uh, promotion of uh, the recognition of competences and skills, 
by non-formal certificates and badges, credit transfer, micro-credentialing, e-portfolios. Well, all of these forms, actually, uh, all of these um, formats of change, in a sense, are already being promoted by uh, um, conventional universities as well. So what differentiates this, uh, or the open universities as such? We're seeing here on, on, the, on this slide, on the picture on the left, that actually refers to the 42, which is an experience um, that is now uh, having quite an impact, in which a university can be formed out of a community that uh, simply, simply shares their knowledge. So uh, the, the community itself can organize in new models of um, uh, edu education, of higher education, that can be, uh, in a way, also uh, in competition to traditional universities and also to open uh, or decent teaching universities. A possible vision for the future of decent education universities can be this one that uh, I'm suggesting here and that I've already addressed in, in, a, in a previous discussion that we had in a, a previous webinar uh, organized by even on this uh, similar topic. On one hand, it is clear for me that open universities are not obsolete as such, as, as, as dedicated institutions and have still an important role to play, even if different from the past and with major variations according to each context, of course, political, cultural, technological, uh, uh, social and so forth, cultural and so forth. Open universities are specially designed institutions, and this is a, a definition that I'm going to, uh, to share with you, um, this proposal. Open universities are special design institutions, which in this, in, the, in this case, they differentiate from, yeah, from others, which use an open network organizational framework. And by, uh, by such, they dedicate or commit themselves to just research and innovation in technology and enhanced learning, but also uh, dedicate to preserve and share their business education legacy, but in order to widen access and participation in higher education for all, in quality higher education for all, independently of context, condition, and barriers. But mainly, their prior mission is to assure that every social group at risk can have access to quality higher education opportunities. And this is something that still makes a difference when we uh, compare it with the uh, uh, conventional universities, even the ones that are uh, much developed in terms of uh, uh, online delivery, online learning delivery. Because of their model and scalable design, open universities are prepared, or decent universities are prepared, to swiftly and organically adjust to continuously changing societal challenges and needs. And in that sense, we can already see an interesting example uh, in, in the recent development in Portugal of how this can actually uh, happen, how can this be organized. In Portugal, there has been, uh, just last, December, last September, the, uh, the publication of a new uh, legal framework uh, for uh, dedicated to distance education, higher distance education. And uh, it sets an holistic approach. So the Portuguese government has set a systemic goal to reach 50,000 students enrolled in formal programs, uh, in distance education formal programs, by the end of the decade. And in order to do that, so to multiply by five well, uh, the, pop the student population in distance enrolled in distance education formal programs, uh, it has uh, reorganized the, the system, generating interdependencies uh, based on the following um, conditions. First of all, that the uh, National Open University, the uh, Universidad Aberta, uh, should now play the role of the National Content Center for this Education, assuring at the same time that it has uh, the national, uh, conducts uh, the, the advanced research and innovation, so that it has that cap installed capability in this field, uh, but it also shares that uh, expertise, that knowledge, that capability with the other university in the system. So it's a kind of a, a dedicated university that uh, concentrates the national effort on this uh, specific um, uh, form of education. On the other hand, it assures the support to all other uh, uh, higher education institutions uh, that, of course, um, also provide uh, online learning by giving them access to infrastructure, if needed, learning design, teacher training expertise, uh, uh, learning design expertise, teacher training, and so forth. All the others, of course, are, uh, in order to receive public funding, are in a way encouraged to establish consortia or working partnership with the National Open University. But at the same time, the National Open University 
uh, as also to deliver most of its uh, education provision in consortia with the others. So there is a kind of uh, interconnection uh, that is established uh, by law in this sense. Um, of course, w uh, when talking about legal frameworks, there are opportunities, but also risks. And uh, uh, if, on one hand, we can say that this uh, Portugal is an example, that is one of the first in Europe. As you know, there are only a few countries in the world that have dedicated legal frameworks for this education. There is the, notably the case of Brazil, Italy, uh, Poland, and not much. Uh, so Portugal is, uh, um, uh, well, one of the first cases in Europe. Um, even if the legislation can be advanced in, such, in, in, in some way, and follows the, uh, the expertise and the best practices. Of course, when you legislate uh, such a dynamic and innovative field as this in education or online learning, we, of course, uh, take the risk of imposing standards and criteria, criteria, as it is said in the slide, which are not flexible enough to accommodate technological change and pedagogical innovation, thus hindering the institutional capability to experiment, which is a critical feature uh, for this form of uh, education. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is uh, this legal framework uh, uh, sets forward an important development, which is uh, the role that is given to uh, the National Quality Assurance Agency. Um, this is something that uh, goes in line, uh, the, um, aligns with uh, the movement in Europe, and this is a very important aspect. But this also uh, implies that this uh, transformation uh, on the part of the Quality Assurance Agencies is uh, supported by um, not only uh, uh, um, a work of, um, uh, of taking in consideration the specific uh, features, the unique features of this education and online learning in general or e-learning, uh, but also are so that are prepared to take that in consideration, but also that their um, teams, evaluating teams, are made up of uh, experts in this education as well. Uh, so that evaluation panels also have experts uh, in a few sort. So in, in end, in the end, so we have just a, a very sh a short amount of time to, to speak and is um, in the webinar. So uh, just to, to make it um, uh, as short as possible, my proposal, my idea, uh, my, uh, my pr the proposal that I submit to you is that, of course, open universities and distance teaching universities have a role. Of course, we're talking about the crisis uh, in the Western world, in a sense, but not all open universities are in crisis. It depends on the local context, on the regional context. And um, uh, the ones that are in crisis actually are the ones that are not connected with social needs in their specific culture, uh, specific context. So what I uh, submit to you is the idea that, of course, open universities have a future, have still an important role to play, but they have to uh, re, uh, in a way, reclaim uh, their uh, mission, their original mission statement, which is, of course, to widen not only the outreach, but the participation of learners in the learning process. And on the other hand, uh, of course, to, uh, come to, to fulfill its social uh, mission, which is uh, crucial, which is paramount, and in some ways, uh, in the recent uh, years, um, open universities have, uh, in a way, failed a little bit to follow that um, um, that mission, mission statement. Well, thank you very much, and I give the, the floor back to Timothy. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very Q &A. much, Antonio, for a very interesting uh, conversation, uh, presentation. Sorry. Um, while I load the next uh, presentation, perhaps you could uh, have a look at a couple of questions you've got there in the chat, one from Alan and one from Tony, and, uh, and uh, sh give us some answers on those, please. So, um, uh, regarding uh, Alan, um, do three the new law in poverty? Uh, well, uh, does the new law in Portugal uh, empower or threaten UAB? Okay, um, you can say that both, in a sense. So uh, it depends on the ability, on the capacity of the university to actually tackle uh, the, the challenges. So on one hand, it gives uh, the university the opportunity to play a crucial role in the system. But on the other hand, the university needs the support of the government in order to uh, have uh, enough capability, uh, enough capacity to fulfill that, that role. So in a sense, the, uh, the law uh, doesn't necessarily 
it, it, it sets a new horizon. It gives you, uh, it opens a lot of opportunities, but it, uh, on the other hand, could be uh, quite harmful if the university is not able to uh, uh, fulfill that expect those expectations. So in this sense, uh, of course, it can be seen either way. Never, uh, just to be uh, to give a short answer, it's also important to state that this new legislation also opens the field clearly to the to the other con to the conventional universities. So, uh, in in both ways, it's opening up the field for both UAB and also for uh, conventional universities in order to explore uh, these uh, emerging uh, territory. Uh, regarding Tony Bates' question, how do regular universities feel about UAB role? Well, it is a mixed feeling. First of all, uh, the first reaction was not uh, good. Uh, they were afraid that the UAB would be playing a dominant role in the sense that would be imposing to them standards and models and uh, also, um, um, in a way, uh, their own infrastructure. But this has uh, already been uh, settled. So. Uh, there was a, a big uh, public discussion, a very interesting uh, the, um, discussion on the law, uh, and the law was corrected in, in some points. And so now you, you, they are starting to see this as also uh, a very important instrument, a very important tool for their own uh, development uh, um, in the field. So for their own uh, capacity uh, to develop their uh, expertise in their provision. So I think that, of course, it will now require some time in order for both UAB and, and, and the traditional universities, professional universities, to, um, to understand their common opportunities and to establish those consortia that will lead to um, the, the results that are expected in, in a way that are foreseen uh, by the new legal framework. Okay, thank you very much. Antonio, very, very good and very concise answers. So I think without more to do, we'll pass over to Tony now. If you'd uh, like to give us your presentation, please. Tony, um, sorry, but I don't think we can hear you. Uh, you have to unmute your mic. Yeah, is that better? It's perfect, yeah. Do you want to go back and start on the first yeah. slide? Sure. Um, I, I, I want to make it very clear from the beginning that I'm talking about the situation in North America here, and I realize that it's very different in Europe. Um, However, I think there are some lessons we can learn from the North American situation uh, that will apply in Europe. Uh, the second thing is I'm focusing more on the online and distance part rather than the open part here. I could have spent the whole time talking about the implications of open in North America, which are in ways very different from the view of open in Europe. But I'm going to focus here just on the online and distance learning part. And in North America, we've seen very strong growth in distance education um, uh, right across the systems. Uh, there are annual surveys of online learning in uh, US, uh, Babson and the Department of Education now have been doing surveys since 2002 of distance education. And in Canada, the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association has been doing annual surveys since 2017. And what we see is strong growth in both countries, despite the fact that regular enrollments are actually flat in Canada or declining in the US. And that's a demographic reason uh, that regular uh, enrollments are flat or declining. Um, some would say that distance education is beginning to eat the, uh, the on-campus enrollments, because obviously if overall enrollments are flat and distance education is growing, then more students are opting for distance education um, than on campus teaching, um, or more and more doing that. 
In Canada, online distance education is now offered by nearly all post-secondary institutions. 83%, in fact, offer distance education courses for credit. That's parts of, parts of degrees. This is not non-credit um, we're talking about here. And almost all distance education in Canada is fully online. It has been for about 15 years. And 18% of all students, post-secondary students, take at least one online course during their studies, only undergraduate, at undergraduate level. And it, it, that amounts to about 8% of all course registrations. It's the equivalent of about four new universities and 12 new colleges if all those people went to regular campuses. So um, although it's relatively small, it's still significant. And what's very interesting is that over two-thirds of all the universities and colleges in Canada uh, believe that online is very or extremely important for the future of their institution. So it's moving from the margins into uh, a central part of university and college strategies now in, in, in Canada. It's slightly different um, in the US, so I'll come to that in a moment. In Canada, the distance teaching universities are struggling. The enrollments are flat or declining at Athabasca University, uh, Teluc, which is the French uh, univ open university, French language open university, uh, Cégep à distance for the colleges, and Thompson Rivers are open learning, Thompson Rivers open learning in British Columbia. Um, the only exception here is Royal, Royal Road University, which is primarily postgraduate, and their enrollments are, are increasing. All these institutions, with perhaps the exception of Royal Roads, are facing major challenges in holding on to their students. For instance, Laval University in Quebec City, which is uh, one of the oldest universities in Canada, is campus-based, but it has now more online enrollments than Athabasca University, which is amazing when you think that uh, French is still a minority language in Canada. So. The, the distance teaching universities are, are really struggling to maintain their enrollments while the regular universities are increasing them. In the US, uh, online and distance learning, they have more, a greater proportion of students doing online, but it's more concentrated in a smaller number of universities, or it's a large number of universities, but small proportion of universities. 33% uh, of students in the U.S. take at least one distance education course for credit, and most of those enrollments are in public or state institutions. Um, it used to be that uh, University of Phoenix and the other for-profits were the major providers of distance education, but uh, federal regulations have had a big impact on those institutions. So we'll still, although they're still very big, University of Phoenix is still the biggest with the biggest amount of enrollments, it's been much more spread out amongst the other institutions now. And what's interesting for me is that online learning is becoming mainstream. Most Canadian institutions have at least 15 years experience of fully online courses. And because of that, there's an increasing move to blended learning, um, where online learning is being integrated into classroom teaching. So the, the, the most prevalent way is still the flipped classroom, where the lecture is recorded, the students watch the lecture online, and then come into class for discussions. But what we are now seeing emerging is some new designs. Um, the illustration here is um, an active classroom at Queen's University, a tr very traditional campus-based university where online learning is being fully integrated and the classrooms are designed, are redesigned to enable this so that students can work at, say, the uh, small groups and can project onto the, the, each table has its own screens and they can share that with the whole group or they can just work individually. And one or two institutions now even have breakout rooms where individuals, students can go and do a little bit of work and come back and join the group again. Um, and we're also seeing increasingly the use of uh, serious games, simulations, and virtual reality being embedded into some of the uh, on-campus teaching. And as a result, nearly all Canadian universities now and most colleges have a learning technology center that's often part of a bigger center for teaching and learning. Um, 
where they have special, spe uh, special expertise in learning design and the use of technology that faculty can draw on. So how can distance teaching universities uh, take, uh, okay, sorry, there, I skipped the slide. Um, there are though issues with online learning at conventional universities. 73% um, of the institutions reported in Canada inadequate training for faculty. They see this as the biggest obstacle. Uh, a great deal of the online learning now is the use of video lectures rather than learning management systems. They, they use learning management systems uh, as well as video lectures, but often the learning management system now is a support for the main delivery medium, which is the video lecturer. Um, and of course, that's because it's too easy for untrained faculty, and that's led to a lot of poor design, such as 50-minute uh, presentations and so on. Too much content, not enough student activity, inadequate feedback. And the other big challenge is that as institutions move to blended learning, and I think nearly all courses will eventually be blended, how do you scale up the support for faculty um, when everybody's doing some kind of mix of face-to-face -face and online learning? So how can distance teaching universities win uh, when the regular institutions are taken on online learning in a large way. Well, I, I think the advantage distance teaching universities usually have is their scale. Uh, they can, if they can build at scale with loss of quality, they can become more cost effective than the existing system. And to do that, they have to have much better designs for online learning than the regular institutions. Designs particularly that develop the knowledge and skills needed in a digital age. Now that's another lecture, but it means changing teaching methods that enable students at a distance to develop high level intellectual skills. And secondly, better world class student support. Um, one of the problems that I see in many distance teaching universities now is that the student support is actually decreasing. For instance, Athabasca University is trying to reduce the number of tutors. Now, there may be other ways, Athabasca is hoping to use artificial intelligence for this, but um, I think we, distance teaching universities have to focus on active learning, quality feedback, and making that really personal. Um, now, I think there is a use for artificial intelligence, so long as it embeds learning theories and scales best teaching practices, that could also help because you need scale for artificial intelligence to work and distance teaching universities can get to that scale. And they must use uh, appropriate educational use of advanced digital technologies. Developing, uh, developing a game from scratch um, is difficult for an individual institution, um, whereas for a distance teaching university, it has the scale, it has the applications, number of applications, that would make it worthwhile. So if they, again, make use of the scale to use advanced digital technologies that have a lot of educational benefits uh, and, and could give a competitive advantage to distance teaching universities. So my questions for discussions, distance, do distance teaching universities have a different market? If, if they do, why are, you, why are we worrying about it? Um, should distance teaching universities do no, what they do now only better to, to uh, meet the competition from regular universities? Do they need to change radically if they are to survive? Or are conventional universities doomed? Distance teaching universities are the future. We are seeing MOOCs, for instance, being accommodated into regular degree programs here. Um, will that eventually replace regular universities? And lastly, as I said, North America is different from Europe. So, what do you think? And that's it. Thank you, Tony, for a very provocative and interesting presentation. I mean, perhaps we can um, delve into some of these questions at the end in our in our discussion period. You, if you have a look at the chat, you can see you've got some uh, some questions coming up. You might like to uh, have a crack at answering. Yeah, um, one from Elena. 
how to develop online distance learning in countries that financial and technical resources. Um, I think that's a very difficult question. Um, I, I, I think the demand is greater in countries without financial and technical resources. Um, it is the scale issue that em enables many countries to have moved towards distance teaching universities because of the scale issue. So, uh, but it's a question of uh, national investment strategies. Do you put all your money into creating uh, a, a large national open university or do you try to build up your traditional institutions? I think the, the, the quickest return on investment would be build large distance teaching universities. And I, there was another question from Liz, I think. Um, how to train the faculty, uh, Maria, very good question. How to train the faculty for distance teaching? Why are we not doing it? The problem is that in regular universities, faculty development is optional. It's not compulsory. And therefore, there's no reason for faculty to do the training. And it's very hard for uh, administrations in regular universities to force faculty to do things they don't want to do because of academic freedom issues. Um, some institutions do now require faculty to take an online course on how to teach online before they're allowed to teach online. But they are rather unusual universities. One is the University of Central Florida, which started as a blended learning university. So until we require university professors to have a teaching certificate before they can teach, I don't see how we can crack this one. I think it's a big problem, but it's not just a problem for uh, distance teaching, it's a problem for classroom teaching as well, because basically the lecture-based model is broken for the kinds of skills and knowledge that we need to develop in our students. So it's not just a distance teaching issue, it, it is also an issue for face-to-face -face classrooms. Okay, thank you very much, Tony. Um, very good answers to the, those questions. We'll have some more time at the end to, of this uh, of this session to go back and uh, look at some of these issues in slightly more detail. But um, to keep us on on track now, I'd like to hand over to to Jose Mota, the the cool kid on the block, for the the next presentation, please. So hi everyone. Yeah, so the um, it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek title, the cool kid on the block. Of course, the key idea in my short talk is going to be that pedagogical innovation can be a competitive advantage for uh, distance teaching universities or distance learning um, universities. And much of what I can say, of course, um, goes together with what Antonio and what Tony Bates have said. I'm going to choose this moment in 2012 when there was this phenomenon called the MOOCs uh, they were lurking with small communities of connectivist enthusiasts and then suddenly they were discovered by um, high profile teachers at Stanford who opened their artificial intelligence uh, class to everyone who wanted to register and then suddenly they had 160,000 students enrolled for their course. And of course this was a big scare in the sense that online learning had been until that point in time, more of a field for specialized universities and then some uh, experiment and some, some uh, courses in uh, traditional universities, but it was not a field where people felt attracted to. Um, and suddenly everyone wanted to do online learning. Then it became mainstream, it became the talk of the day. And after Stanford got in, after Coursera, Udemy were created, every university wanted to jump on that bandwagon and take advantage of what seemed to be a very um, easy way to increase your uh, student numbers. And for many people also, um, um, this idea that it might be cheaper than what they did uh, before, which, which can be, of course, a false, a false idea. The thing is, suddenly, distance teaching universities were faced uh, with a very tough competition from these very well settled, very well established, uh, well branded traditional universities that um, found uh, in many cases a lot easier to attract students um, to enroll in their courses. 
And so the natural question that arose then was, if, if anyone can do distance uh, and online learning, why do we need specific institutions for that? Why do we need distance education universities now that we can do uh, what they did in the past? Of course, uh, when they look at um, the strategies used to uh, implement the courses, this was that old story of doing something apparently new using the old methods. Uh, so these people did not go back and look at the history of distance education, online learning, decades and decades of theoretical experiments, of practices, of reflections, of uh, pedagogical innovation, and they just went for the things they knew. Um, and Tony has already talked about some of them. So what they knew was the lecture, um, and then some videos because they were traditionally used in distance education a few decades ago, and then quizzes for the videos, some discussion forums, um, and they had, you know, they created this symbiosis, which is interesting, and they took um, old methods from both fields. So they took old methods from face-to-face -face teaching, and they, they took old methods from distance education, and that's where the pedagogy went. Of course, it was also very platform-centric. It was very much also about the technology. And when we look at currently what's happening in, in universities trying to explore online learning, it's a, a big focus on the technology, technological part. It's the, the classroom of the future. It's those technological labs that Tony showed us. Uh, things revolve more around technology than about conversations and about uh, interactions and about sharing. And so you would say, OK, we live in a networked society. The idea of knowledge uh, has changed. The way the information and the content is produced and transmitted and disseminated in the networks has changed. Um, it is now in the power of more people outside institutions and organizations to make culture go forward and to create content and to interact with that content. And so when you have a society that has this uh, new perspective on knowledge and on information and how it is produced, how it is shared, you also need a different way to approach education, to approach learning. And so you need more participatory pedagogies that go along with a participatory kind of um, society. Um, and then you thought, OK, this is a great opportunity for distance education universities, because a lot of people want to do the online learning, but many of them, or most of them, don't have a clue on how to do that. And so what do distance education universities, universities have uh, that goes for them? Well, they have a long experience in innovating pedagogically, of course. Um, and they have something which is they have been able to adapt to different generations of technologies. Uh, and this, this thing of the generations is this, in distance education is a, a core aspect of the field. Every time new technologies came about, distance education universities were able to find the new, tech, the new pedagogies that made the most of these technologies. But then when we look at reality, this happened uh, very far and wide and not with most uh, distance education universities. Uh, in many of them, innovation just stalled. Uh, they didn't get Web 2.0, they didn't get cyberculture, they didn't get the network society, and they were a bit like held back and imprisoned by the old methodologies that have worked in the past. So those legacy investments in print and broadcast, the centralized computer systems, the idea of everything very well planned, very well distributed in the package. And so many of them did not open to these new affordances that we were having in society. Of course, also something else Tony talked about, and that is um, if you migrate to online learning and you want to become a virtual online university, you need to retrain your teaching staff. And this is not something easy to do, and we know that in Universidad uh, Verde in Portugal, because uh, we had to train every one of our teachers, and we had to train every teacher that was uh, from outside institutions collaborating with Universidad Verde. And this was a very, very heavy task and very difficult one, which was led, I might say, by my colleague Antonio Teixeira very successfully. And so, uh, I think what we need is we need to focus on network learning as the right answer for a network society. So if you want to think about learning in the context of a network society, you need to think about how people learn in a network. 
And of course, it's obvious that there is a very strong social dimension when you're learning in a network. There is an emphasis on collaboration versus competition. It's all about dialogue and interaction. You know, uh, people say that when, when Web 2.0 was, was exploding, it's all about the conversation. It's about interactions, about encounters, about experiences that people share. It's also about openness of practice and of resources, even of syllabus. These are active learners. These are people that should have a say in defining some parts of their curriculum, some of the things they learn, how they learn some of the things, some of the objectives that they feel like are important for them. We need to bring them in and we need to accept that these are people who can contribute to make a more creative and more productive syllabus. Also, of course, this blending of formal, non-formal and informal learning that is very much characteristic of today's world in which our paths are always, you know, intermingling things you do in a formal context that, you know, then go out into an informal context and then we have feedback from there into non-formal or formal context again. So it's, it's a kind of a circular thing as networks really operate. And so I think the key for open universities and distance education universities is to refocus on pedagogical innovation is to uh, uh, go back and find again that spark that has brought them decades into the future when, when they, uh, uh, um, every time a new generation came, they were able to adapt and to evolve. And we have some great ideas for, 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 for network learning, uh, like connectivism or isometric education. Of course, they're not f pedagogies which are uh, fully polished. They need, they need development. They need to be adapted. They need to be um, deepened but they have some very key ideas that I think some very solid building blocks on which we can think of a pedagogy for digital age, including, of course, all of those other things that Tony mentioned in his presentation, games, badges, uh, virtual reality, even AI in some cases. We also have some very well established pedagogies like the community of inquiry that has been on for like 20 years and it has evolved, it has been, uh, you know, completely updated with a lot of new things that are more akin to the uh, network society and all the things that social, social software brought about and made possible. So to finalize, I would say distance education universities, they have a chance if they keep themselves one of the steps ahead. So if everyone is doing MOOCs, distance teaching education should be doing something else. They should be working on the new frontier, they should be discovering the new concept, they should be trying the new pedagogies that are lurking and emerging in places where nobody is looking at now. Uh, so, um, and that is because I think they should try and to, to be recognized as a specialist in the field. So you say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a student in a face-to-face -face institution and I do some online courses, some, some part of my credit is online, but if you want to do an online um, full course and if you want to do a real quality um, learning experience, you would go for a distance education university because you recognize them as specialized in that field. It's their core business. It's what they do. It's not something they do besides a lot of other things. And so this also, I think, helps you be cool. It, it, it helps you separate yourself from the herds and make yourself not, not noticed and relevant because you're trending, you're cool, you're up to date, you always seem to know what's coming next and you seem to be working always with a foot in the future. And I think that for today's public, especially adults like uh, public, uh, like business education generally has, so adults with a family or with a profession or with experience, this is very enticing that you can come into a context where you are recognized as a partner, something, someone who can contribute to how things are done and s someone who is in a context that is always probing for the future and trying new things and, and more productive things. So this is what I uh, chose to say in these 10 minutes. Of course, best wishes from Lisbon. I hope you can come and visit us because this is a great place to be. <laughs> and thank you very much. Uh, Jose. No, I think that was a very interesting and very provocative uh, um, presentation. You've given us a lot to, to think about. And um, if, uh, if we have any questions, can you please put them in the, uh, in the chat? Give uh, Jose a chance to, to answer them. 
while the, the, the questions are going in there, I think uh, what you said is, uh, is very good. And I think we'll also have to evolve our students more and more in this process also as we move forward. It seem to be the, the people who are deciding the tools that they want to use more than, more than we are. So do we have any questions? Okay. Uh, Jose, perhaps you could uh, answer the question that, uh, well, well, I said it wasn't really a question, but I can phrase it as such. Um, how do you see the role of, of students in this, in this process of moving forward to new models of um, distance uh, education universities? So you have to activate your microphone. We, we can't hear you. Yeah. Um, I was saying that uh, distance education students uh, have always been a different public than uh, what traditional universities have. So it's not like high school students in their 17s or 18s that come to university still living with their parents. Uh, it's mostly adults, many of them with a family, many of them with, with a professional um, experience which is relevant and these people today they, they feel like they want to have a voice they don't want to be someone who goes into a course to be told what to do all the time and have no say in how things are done because many of them also already have a pretty good idea of some of the things they need to learn and some of the skills they need to develop and because many of them have this experience either personal or professional they feel they can contribute to this it's, it's also a, a context where conversations um, and interactions are very productive because you're talking about people that can bring in a lot of di different experiences, even cultural backgrounds, professional backgrounds. So I think this is not going to change a lot. I, I believe that distance education students are not going to be most of them, the 18 year olds who come out of high school. Um, it's mostly going to be people who are already in a more advanced phase in their lives. And I think, um, I, I believe that this is true, even for these 18 year olds who come to university, they, that you should have a voice. But of course, I think a more adult population, a more adult student population has uh, more skills, has more ideas, has um, more substance to what they can contribute in terms, for example, of the curriculum, in terms, for example, of some of the methodologies. And of course, I'm not saying they're coming in and dictating what is going to be done. Uh, this is a conversation and of course most of the things need to be decided by uh, the teaching staff and by the specialists but they should also have a place to bring in their experience to bring in their needs and to to take part in the conversation so that uh, the context results in a much more um, you know productive and, and interesting context of course uh, this also revolves a bit about something that Tony just you know touched uh, very quickly and I didn't even talk about which is something which I really really am interested in which are the person learning environments because that is the concept that aggregates uh, the capacity of a student to be able to bring in all these experiences from informal non-formal and formal education all these conversations all of these encounters all, all of these interactions into a system that he creates for himself and where he organizes and filters and makes the most of the information and then he himself or he her, or she herself produces knowledge in the form of artifacts, in the form of ways of showing, uh, ways of displaying the competencies and the knowledge that the person developed and, and that the person can share with other people and that can be helpful for other people. And so again, it's not only the teacher who is teaching or the resource who is teaching, it's also the people learning that after doing their process and after you know, integrating and learning and reflecting, they create something to show their, their you know, understanding of the content. They can also produce very interesting uh, resources for that other people to learn from. And so, I don't know, I'm not going to say much more because time is, of course, short. I think you get the idea. Wonderful, uh, Jose. Thank you very much for that answer. There's some other questions in the chat, but I, I think we'll leave them for for the end. And uh, let's move swiftly on to Alan Tate. Alan, if you'd like to, to start your presentation, please. Oh, I can't hear you, sorry. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, and hello, colleagues. 
Uh, can, can you move a little closer to the microphone, please, Alan? Yeah. Is that, is that any better? A little. Oh, it's the volume's gone down. So I need to just change the volume. How about that? That must be better. Ah, perfect. Thank you very good, much. Good, good. Okay. Um, so, uh, great to be here. Thank you very much to Eden and to Tim for the invitation to take part. Um, what I've got to say has some significant links with um, colleagues who've spoken before me, which is not surprising because I've certainly discussed the issue of the Open University as an institutional model with, with Antonio and with Tony. Um, in the past. Um, and what um, you've got on the slide here are three articles in which over quite a period I've tried to develop an analysis, a critical analysis of the Open University model because I've sat at too many occasions, too many conferences, too many meetings where there's been a deal of complacency and self-congratulation within Open Universities and I think um, a failure to engage with the way the landscape of higher education in which open universities, distant teaching universities find themselves has changed. Um, the, what I've got to say is drawn primarily out of that first article there and one and two are in open source journals so they're easily found. And in the, the article, the editorial that Ross Paul and I have written, Ross being a colleague from British Columbia in Canada, um, uh, we um, set out in that special issue, we, the special issue is called Open Universities, Past, Present and Future, um, a critical analysis which my, my, my comments are drawn from today. The, the special issue, which if you have the time to look up, you might enjoy, has 12 articles about open universities drawn from Asia, Africa, North America, South America, the Middle East and Europe. Um, uh, and they're mostly case studies with some thematic studies. But in all of them, I hope you'll find that we have encouraged colleagues to avoid the complacency, which I think is, is worryingly still dominant in many meetings where open universities get together. Um, in a nutshell, what I've got to say revolves around this proposition, which, which, which you, can, you can think about while I go through the rest of what I've got to say. The digital revolution has reorganized many sectors. Um, the way we listen to music and buy music, the way we uh, shop on the high street, many, many areas have been reorganised. And the core question I've got is whether the Open University model will survive the re reorganisation of the education landscape. Um, I, I, and I, I think the answer is open about that. So let me see if I can persuade you that that's the case. But let's begin on, on, on the sort of um, the big pluses that the Open University model has produced. So the Open University model is 50 years old this year, the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Open University in the UK. Um, and there are something like 60 to 80 open universities around the world, depending exactly how you count. And there are still open universities being founded, still new open universities being founded. For example, Botswana created an open university last year. Kazakhstan is in an advanced stage of, of, of creating a new open university. So you'd say, well, the open university model is still clearly current and vibrant. And there are something like 8 million students in open universities around the world, as, as best you can count them. Um, so it's still a very major phenomenon. Um, but I think it would be very unwise to fail to consider some of the critical challenges to the Open University model today. Um, for example, in the UK, the Open University has been really wrong-footed by a change in government policy in England, which is the Open University's biggest market, about 80% of its students, uh, around fees. And the Open University has lost in 10 years something like one third of its students. In Europe, which has the second largest number of Open Universities as a world region, um, of the eight Open Universities, um, although discretion prevents me naming them, I think four have been challenged existentially over the last 10 years. And those challenges have primarily been governments losing confidence in the institution model and asking themselves whether it had a future. Uh, in Canada, what's often called the, the Open University of Canada, Athabasca has itself been through, I think, an existential crisis over the last three years, caused by a number of things, of course. Uh, but Tony can perhaps co comment on that in, in more depth of knowledge than me. And in Asia, where there are more open universities as a region than in any other continent, I think it's fair to say 
that the challenges around quality are still extremely uh, concerning and indeed there are large countries very significant countries where the quality of the open universities is is, is um, people are widely skeptical of what's happened but let's just remind ourselves of why the open university model did become has become so important and i think it's because open universities pioneered five um, singularly important features the mission to include new audiences higher in higher education has been pioneered by open universities over at least five decades and i think it's fair to say that open universities have changed the broad understanding of who can go to university. Secondly, open universities pioneered a new focus on learning and teaching. They had to because they were admitting new kinds of students, first time entrants from families without higher education and the challenges of learning at a distance demanded study skills, self-confidence and social capital, which open universities tried to um, create through innovation in learning and teaching methods and student support, putting that under the same umbrella. Thirdly, Open Universities committed early and very firmly to the deployment of new technologies to support learning and teaching, uh, pioneering methods of course production and design and student services. Fourthly, the idea of such large-scale universities was in its time significantly different from what had been assumed was a characteristic of a university up till that point. Open Universities existed in order to change how post-secondary education was conceived and so innovation I think was embedded as a core feature of open universities. So open universities have got a great deal to be proud of and I wouldn't want anything I've got to say to take away from that but and I think there is a big but what you could call those those five features you could call the first mover advantage of open universities and that has been very substantially eroded elsewhere by developments in the university sector in many countries and it's my view that this erosion of their first mover advantage has not been adequately noticed or addressed by open universities themselves many of the features that were adopted for the first time on any significant scale scale by open universities are now more widely shared as the move to mass higher education in all developed countries and increasingly in middle income countries um, takes place. Uh, these features include a much wider recognition that part-time routes to study have to accompany the traditional full-time campus-based mode and that the much wider range of student backgrounds in mass higher education has to be accompanied by commitments to reform teaching and student support. New entrants, notably online universities and traditional univers institutions um, moving significantly to online and blended learning, provide significant competition for longer established open universities which have struggled to move successfully from earlier distance education models into online modes. So I would argue that in most countries open universities are increasingly struggling to maintain their primacy in a much more competitive and complex environment of blended learning and dual mode campuses. And while a very few governments have kept the monopoly position of their open university to deliver part-time and distance education within the country, this is less and less sustainable in the face of burgeoning new technologies for teaching on so many campuses. So if we look at the next 15 or so years with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, they propose an enormous uh, growth in higher education, uh, from something like 260 million places around the world to 400 million places. Uh, and this is while um, mass higher education is created in middle and lower middle in and some middle lower middle income countries as well as in upper middle upper income countries which has already happened and this is particularly important for countries on the scale of china india brazil and south africa uh, now 20 years ago only the natural conclusion i think of many governments would be well we'll do this mass in, in, in increasing scale with more open university models but that is not what is being said today in many of these countries and the question I think I would want to highlight um, uh, this, this evening is whether the open university model retains the dynamic energy and innovatory character to gain the trust of governments with that task of moving to mass higher education or will the much wider range of models available today including blended delivery dual mode campuses and new online universities crowd out the place 
of open universities in the higher education landscape. And so, in conclusion, I think what's important for open universities uh, is that they do a SWOT analysis. There are certainly many opportunities. There's worldwide access to the internet, uh, although many, many challenges, particularly in rural areas in poorer countries. There's a major expansion of higher education envisaged by the UN, which governments have agreed with. Um, there's m far more trends for international collaboration and open educational resources. And there are international trends for more lifelong learning and continuous professional upgrading. Open universities continue to have significant strengths. The mission-centred, mission-embedded commitment to openness, flexibility and access, the capacity for large scale, the dedicated support for part-time students and the commitment to technology-enhanced learning. However, there are significant weaknesses which continue and which I think open universities are finding it difficult to address. Firstly, the in some, ca some cases absolutely dismal completion and graduation rates. Uh, there's issues in some countries at least of reputation and brand. I think that's particularly true in Asia. There are, ironically, resistance to change from within open universities themselves on the part of staff. So some open universities have become quite conservative and become embedded in second generation distance education and finding it difficult to move to the new models of innovation, which are absolutely necessary. And so there are threats, threats to the open university model as an institution. Burgeoning distance education provision, as other colleagues have mentioned, in mainstream universities. I think evidence of governmental disenchantment in some countries at least with the open university model uh, and of course innovation taking place elsewhere like MOOCs which weren't born out of open universities but were born out of other universities completely. So I'll end my comments there to say I don't want anything I've said to take away from the major achievements of open universities but I do want to put that institutional model under a critical focus and have some discussion with you all about how reform uh, and revolution, perhaps even in the open university model, is going to assure it for the next period. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, we see some comments in the in the chat. There's been some slight problems with the links, which I will fix. Um, do we have any any questions? There's one from from Liz for you there, Alan. Okay, so, so... So, your volume's gone again. Can you move closer to the mic, please? There we go. It keeps, it keeps um, turning itself down for some reason. It's got a mind of its own, Tim. Um, so, Liz Marr asks, is there any hope? What might we do? Well, I, there's always hope. And I think there are open universities which have um, uh, begun to address these issues. And I think the, 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 the open university where Liz is pro-vice-chancellor is one of those. Um, uh, I think it's been through a tough time. Um, I also agree with Antonio that open university leadership in many instances has been at fault. Um, there have been wonderful presidents, rectors, vice chancellors in open universities, but I think in too many cases we've seen some open university leaders um, taking open universities up a cul-de-sac. Um, and that's, I think, leadership development for open universities is a crucially important issue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, Don has a question for you as well, Alan, if you, if you look at the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very well put. Don, I, th I think your first point is is, 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 is is very persuasively put. I think um, is perhaps the success of open universities in showing that new kinds of audiences can be admitted to study in higher education, which has made it possible for other universities to follow. But it's not always the case that the original innovators succeed in the long run. That's my real concern. 
Wonderful. Alan, if we have any other comments or questions, we can, we can leave them uh, to the end. So we can move on now to, to Liz Ma, our last speaker, who uh, is in a fortunate position of uh, being as a pro vice chancellor in the OU UK, but also is in her capacity as EADTU president, can uh, share her opinions with us uh, now. Liz, thank you. You need to switch your microphone on, I think. Perfectly. Thank you, Liz. Hello. Can you hear me all right now? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for um, for the invitation to be here. Uh, uh, you said, yes, it's great to be last, um, Tim, but actually one of the problems is that everybody said all the things that I was going to say. So, uh, But what I want to do is, is try to perhaps give us all a little bit more hope and uh, after after Alan's um, presentation, uh, but also picking up um, um, on what Don just said around um, around the, the ways that we can um, we can support the rest of the sector and and, and reclothe ourselves uh, in a more in a, in, in a way that can help us survive. Um, I'm I'm always struck, um, constantly reminded of a comment which John Daniel made a couple of years ago, which was, "How do open universities dress now that traditional universities have stolen their clothes?" And it sounds like that's been quite a a theme of the discussions that we've been hearing tonight. But I want to step back from that, and I want to look at um, the situation from a, an EADTU perspective. And I particularly want to go on to um, consider the issues that came up at, uh, at our last conference um, through all of the presentations that we heard and through the keynotes, and look at the things that EADTU as a representative body of European distance teaching universities is trying to do uh, to, to, to kind of do that reclothing and to look at and, and to help with the influence on the wider sector. So I've only got two slides um, and the first one is around the challenges and opportunities that, that I perceive for European distance education. And in a sense, these are the same kinds of challenges and opportunities that exist um, uh, globally um, and uh, in many other parts of the world. So, so a lot of the issues that we're facing now are to do with skills and skills for kind of global competitiveness, um, disparities in skills levels um, across all of the EU member states. So if I look particularly at the UK, at the UK um, there are very clearly skills gaps which have been which are, are developing in key areas which will impact on on the ability of the country to move forwards in in terms of getting involved in competitive industry and really de driving the economy forwards and those skill gaps are not going to be met uh, any longer by the traditional model of a uh, three year um, higher education for school leavers, they really are only going to be met through a much a, a very different approach to um, higher education, which is really premised on the notion of lifelong learning. Um, and, and so it isn't just in the UK, it's across Europe that we're seeing those problems and that within and between EU member states there are real skills imbalances uh, that we need to address. Um, by the way, I am making an assumption here that we are still in Europe while I'm talking from a UK perspective. <laughs> so um, the, the, the second issue which um, came up, and I think this has been mentioned by a couple of people already, is that we, we have insufficient skills in delivering flexible, just-in-time online learning at higher education level. So this has come out in, an, in a number of talks so far, and, it, and it's about the need for us to develop our faculty, to develop our academic staff, develop our tutors, in terms of delivering in a way that's more appropriate for the learning requirements of the learners of the future, the learners of now and of the future. Um, so if you look at the way that, that young people are absorbing knowledge and learning now, they're doing it in very different ways to how we did when we were at school and when we were at universities. So they're going to expect very different things in terms of what they get when they do go on to higher education study. So I have a grandson who experiences the world 
in in reality, but also a lot through screens. And he's learning um, to use that screen experience uh, in in a way that will really influence how he accesses um, education and higher education in the future. And at the moment, we don't. I don't believe that there are sufficient skills of the type essential for us to take advantage of the technologies that are available to us um, to be able to deliver in the way that needs to be done. Um, there was also a feeling at the at the conference that um, there's a need for much greater cooperation across European universities, that we need to work together to collaborate in new and different ways. Um, and that includes both distance and open universities and those in the traditional mainstream sector. And that that cooperation is being addressed very much through European policy, um, but that sometimes is at odds with regional and national policies, which make things um, different. And I'm going to say a little bit about um, the policy issue in, in a moment. Um, a really big issue that's been coming up um, more recently is, is how to address diversity and inclusion at a distance. So one of the things we're finding at the OU UK is that we have an increasing number of students who are registering, recording a, a disability. Um, that might be a, a, a visible physical disability, or it could be a learning disability or a mental health um, issue that is challenging their ability to learn in, in traditional ways. Um, we have approximately 29,000 students who are now registering with a disability with us. Um, Anadolu University has similar numbers. Out of one and a half million students, they have around they have over 20,000 who are recording a disability when they register with them. So this, for me, that's a that's that's a positive in the sense that it shows that open and distance universities, in particular, have have a a role to fulfil in terms of reaching a, a a part of the population that isn't well served by the traditional sector. But it also has its its own challenges in terms of um, making the adjustments that are required in order to deliver in an effective way, and uh, and that that's an issue that came up a number of times in the conference in in different formats in in different sessions, and and one that I think is something that we need to put on the EADTU at, uh, agenda um, moving forwards. And then the, 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 the other issue which came up was around delivering what the market needs. And there's a sense that with the, the change, changes in, um, in, in future employment, um, the, the move to the gig economy, the kind of uber world that we're living in, um, the no more um, careers or jobs for life, but people moving and progressing, changing direction, that the that higher education needs to deliver a different kind of product. So the, the three-year degree may have a place, or the four-year degree, or whatever it is that's offered, may have a place uh, in, a, in a single subject discipline. So for example, you would want to ensure that you had sufficient doctors who had a, a, a medical qualification uh, that was soundly and robustly based in, 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 in research and knowledge and experience and practice. But when they need to update, in order to take advantage of new technology, for example, they really need to. We really need to be able to deliver um, what that need is at the point of need and at the time of need. And the flexibility which distance teaching universities have always had at their heart is a way of um, making sure that that can happen. So I'm going to I'm going to move on. So having highlighted some of the challenges and opportunities, and I have to say there are many more than that. Um, that, that the whole sector is, is facing. But there are some things which EADTU has been doing uh, in order to try and, and, and cope with some of those things and to reflect the changing nature of the open and distance um, teaching university um, sector. So EADTU has been doing um, a lot of work in a number of areas. Some of these are in funded projects. Some of these are in, um, in, in um, uh, peer learning events that have been supported by EADTU, um, and some of them are ongoing business that's, that's funded um, for and by the membership. 
So the, the first area I want to comment on is quality of online provision. And um, Antonio touched on that, and I think others have mentioned it as well. Um, one of the concerns that has been expressed in a number of fora where I've been recently is that the quality of online and distance education is, some, is in some places perceived as being lower than traditional face-to-face. -face. It's not necessarily the case. It might be the case, but it's not necessarily the case. But there is a perception there, and some countries still don't recognize online um, qualifications, online provision. So we do know that um, that Open University UK degrees are not necessarily recognized in, in, um, in other countries in the world, and we have to warn students around that. Um, but EAGTU has been working um, with EDIN and with other organizations to agree a pan-European framework, which step goes above, um, uh, well, goes broader than what NQA is able to do at the moment. Um, they've introduced their own e-excellence awards, which are based on peer review and encourage self-assessment, reflection, and action planning. So they're working hard to kind of address that quality issue. Um, that so many of us are concerned about. They're also, um, we are also looking at the, the development of blended education and how the distance teaching and online provision or providers of higher education can really support the wider sector in terms of developing those blended educational skills. So the, the embed project is looking at um, a conceptual framework for blended on-campus degree education. Um, it's based on uh, state-of-the-art theories, good practices on blended learning, and wider validation by experts and practitioners all over Europe. And um, we're working with um, we're both, both within Eden and ICDA to see if we can extend that um, uh, that that further into other parts of the world. Um, we've been doing quite a lot of work on virtual mobility. So when I was talking earlier about diversity and inclusion, one of the challenges that students who have limited um, limited um, mobility uh, or have disabilities or have caring responsibilities or are in full-time employment, it's very difficult for them to take advantage of um, uh, um, international mobility uh, to study at other organizations. Um, but online and distance education makes that mobility possible in a virtual framework so that it provides opportunities there. The, the, networking, um, the networking of the European Universities Initiative is designed to um, create excellence, innovation, and inclusion in higher education across Europe. There are a number of um, alliances already in place, 17 of those, um, with 114 universities from 24 countries. And it's anticipated by 2030 there will be 100 such alliances. And the long-term intention of that is for um, cooperation, complementary curricula, and joint degrees with embedded mobility. So here is a, an opportunity for open and distance um, providers uh, to participate in networks where they're kind of setting the setting the running, really setting the pace uh, for what needs to be done. Um, there's work ongoing on a EU university hub, which is also known as the or now known as the Bloom Hub, which will be a single point of access for online learning in Europe. Um, providing pedagogies, uh, models, guidelines to enhance and accelerate joint development and delivery, delivery of collaborative courses and mobility, um, and, and many other things besides. There's a work which has been done uh, around um, a European MOOC consortium, so the, the uh, five, four platforms in, in Europe, five platforms, I'm sorry, coming together um, to collaborate on the development, for example, of micro-credentials, so smaller amounts of learning which can be offered much more flexibly, which are stackable, which meet market needs, um, and which are a way of diversifying income um, for the partner institutions. Uh, what they really need is for institutions to come together to recognize each other's credit um, and to uh, collaborate on the production um, of, the, of those qualifications. Um, and finally, the European Short Learning Programs is another Erasmus-funded piece of work that, um, that is helping uh, universities to 
produce shorter programs of learning which are less than a, a full qualification. So they could be at 60x, they could be at 30x, they could be at 50x or 5x, um, but, but um, really pushing that development so it can sit alongside micro-credentials, so the programs might be made up of micro-credentials, but they can be delivered much more flexibly across, uh, across the whole sector, even across the whole of Europe, and the recognition will allow um, people to move into different labor markets in, in different um, European countries. So that's just a very quick flavor of um, what we're doing at EADTU to address some of the challenges that open and distance universities have been facing. And, and I see a very positive future um, for, um, for organizations which have been very radical and very innovative in their approaches and which still have a role in continuing to, to do that. Thank you very um, much, so uh, Liz. Um, well, if me, you go to the, the chat and scroll up a bit, you can see that um, Antonio and Ilya have, uh, have left a couple of questions for you there. OK. Um, so I'm just trying to find them. Well, um, the first one is from, from Antonio to here. Sorry, who, he who says, well, say I'll read it out to you. That might be easier. He says, nice idea. You got it. Great. Oh, no, it's OK. I found it. I found it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Nice ideas, but collaboration amongst European OUs could still improve extensively. Um, scale effective jointly delivering degrees, for instance, is underdeveloped. Absolutely. Uh, and I think we're seeing quite a few challenges, which the which particularly the European Short Learning Programs project is 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 trying to resolve. So, for example, um, we have um, that there is uh, there is one work stream which is looking to, to collaboratively develop um, short learning programs between one or two or more um, universities. Um, the questions are around funding, around pricing around recognition, so all of those still, things still have to be um, resolved. So I think there's, there is more that we can do, but there's a lot we're learning about the barriers that are in place that we need to, or the hurdles that are there that we need to actually try and address. Um, so yes, we can do more. Um, I'm just looking at Ilya's question, is it necessary for states to adopt the Global Convention on Distance Education? Um, which would establish uniform requirements for the activities of open universities. I think part, part of the problem um, that we've identified is that the open universities, that they, they kind of share features and similarities, but they all operate in different regulatory contexts. And those regulatory contexts um, limit or, or constrain or restrict the things that they might do. So that there's, there's always that extra layer of, of, um, of regulation or policy or whatever which which prevents um, which which limits the possibility of, of um, as adopting exactly the same approaches to what we do um, so I think a more general um, maybe thinking about something like uh, the, the lifelong learning charter or really rethinking something like that and about how all universities could contribute to that would be one way would we be one way forward um, but I don't know of a similar document that exists but I would like to go away and think about that if Thank I may. You. unless Alan could answer the question Are you going to answer, Alan? Sorry, we, we, no. we can't <laughs> hear you. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Um, I think uh, we've had some interaction, thanks to the chat. I'm extremely grateful for our, our speakers, but um, I'm not not going to let you off the hook without one thing I'd like to ask you, please. And that is, since we've had a, a webinar about the future, the possible futures for distance education, I'd like one concrete prediction for something each of you think will happen or might happen in the field of distance educational institutions in the next 10 years, in the next decade. So can we very quickly um, go 
speaker to speaker, and um, can you give me an answer for that? Um, Antonio, can we start with you, please? Uh, well, Tim, we haven't agreed on the, on the question, so I wasn't prepared. <laughs> but anyway, uh, well, um, I, I think that the, the biggest impact that we'll have in the next decade will be, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the, the use of artificial intelligence. So uh, how is AI uh, going to impact on many of the things that have been discussed here? On, for instance, on the uh, um, on um, uh, uh, on the role of tutoring, on uh, so on also on the allowing for a, a bigger, a larger degree of personalization, um, on developing new forms of recognizing um, skills, uh, for instance, life skills and things like that. So. Um, the, uh, the impact that uh, artificial the use of artificial intelligence or AI um, in online learning is going to be probably the biggest uh, um, the biggest thing in the next decade. Of course, this has a lot of implications, also ethical and so on. Indeed, but that's great, Antonio. And it's harder for you because you're the first one who's had to answer. Um, Tony, what's your answer to that question? I think we'll see a global open university, at least one, uh, one that operates uh, across the world. Um, unfortunately, it's likely to be in English or, or Chinese, um, probably English. Um, it m probably will be commercial rather than public as well. Um, and it will probably come out of the United States, I suspect. But I don't think it's a good development, but I think it's, it's, it's a likely one. OK, that's a great answer. Thank you. Jose? As I said in my presentation, I think the uh, only way of remaining relevant uh, for distance education universities um, is to be innovative and perceived as doing something which is different and better and uh, more advanced than you know, the mainstream institutions, than what the main institutions are doing. Otherwise, I think uh, distance education universities will just be absorbed and engulfed in partnerships and, you know, uh, with other universities and they, they will just, you know, um, disappear as, as independent entities uh, doing something which is a core business of their own in their own way. And this is uh, the risk in Portugal, for example, with this new law that uh, Antonio talked about. It said, uh, the, you know, the Open University in Portugal may very well become a kind of a, you know, technological, in, you know, instructional design department for other, for other universities because they have a social prestige, they have the means, they have the investment, and they have the power of attracting numbers of students and of people who are influencers at, at, at top level in society. So, as I said, um, and, uh, this is something which uh, I didn't know uh, from, from John Daniel, which is, uh, you know, uh, these universities that, that uh, you know, put on the clothes of distance education universities. Um, they can do many of these things very well and they can pass on as, as distance uh, or, or online universities. So, um, I think these institutions need to go in the way Liz was also saying, that become better and very differentiated at what they do, so that when people want to choose an online learning experience, they will go for the specialists and not for uh, the mainstream of what people are doing in traditional universities. Okay, President, thank you. Alan, your prediction, please. Yes, can you hear Absolutely. me? Absolutely. Can you hear me, Tim? I can indeed. Brilliant. Um, so, my, my, my prediction um, is that the core of innovation will move to curriculum reform, to make curriculum compelling for the new audiences, and to qualification reform, as I think Liz has mentioned, because I think the bachelor's and master's structure, is, is, uh, which dominates so nearly entirely, is inadequate for the future. So I think innovation will pass to curriculum and qualification reforms. Very good, very good. Liz, lastly? Thank you. Um, I don't know whether this is symbolic, but I'm in my office and all the lights have gone out. So that's why I'm in the dark. <laughs> but
but <laughs> my prediction was really going to be what 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 Alan said. I think um, in in the next ten years we will see distance teaching universities leading the way in much more flexible approaches to qualifications, um, which are stackable, where people can. Um, pick what they want at the time that they need it and build up to a degree or okay. a postgraduate well, thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to our, our presenters for a, a very interesting and highly entertaining uh, period of, re of reflection. I think we've learned a lot to this afternoon and thank you very much to everybody who's been with us during this, uh, this presentation. So um, I think we'll, we'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for managing the session. Thanks. Very brilliantly, I'd say. That's very kind. Bye bye. All. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the participants. I appreciate your comment.